Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this video, I'm going to start a new example for rigid connection of a beam to a column according to Eurocode 993 uh, part 18. Uh, in the previous videos, we went through the TSO understanding, how it works and what kind of failure modes we might have. Uh, and in this example, I'm going to first calculate by hand according to the code and then we are going to model the same question with ANSI software. Let's continue. So let's uh, introduce the question and understand what I have in my mind for this example. Assume that we have a column with the cross section of HEB300 and we have a beam connected with an end plate HEA200. The dimension of the plate is shown here. It's 250 width and 320 in height in millimeter. Also, the location of the holes are shown. We assume that the place of the holes are quite fine. And we have 6M20 for this example. So let's write down the um, assumptions. We have 6T20 with the class of m 88 uh, all parties are from s355 what else nothing here the other section we can see from the top here we have uh, the beam hea200 and the column heb300 and now the question is what is the uh, moment resistance of this connection in eurocode uh, if you want to understand how to do it it's a lot of work uh, here and there you need to find relevant clauses and i'm going to go through table 61 first of all what needs to be checked so here we can see that in table 61 we have the basic joint components and according to the joint uh, we need to check different parties for example as we have end plate connected to or welded to a beam and then bolted to the column. So if we go through table 6.1, we can see that column web panel in shear needs to be checked. And then here we have design resistance reference to application rules. And then a stiffness coefficient, we will come to this 6.32 and rotation capacity 6.42 and 6.43. Then column web in transverse compression column web in transfer tension, column flange in bending, and plate in bending. And then it comes to flange cleat in bending, which is not uh, our case. In the next page of table 6.1, we can see other relevant uh, criterion that we need to consider here. We can see that beam or column flange and web in compression. This is also applied to us beam web intention then bolt intention and the rest are something that are not relevant uh, to our case there are also another page if you go to eurocode you will see this the next page as well here we can see that there are other criteria that we need to check if it is applied to our case for example concrete in compression it's not our case base plate no base plate no anchor bolt no anchor bolt no anchor bolt and welds should be checked for the calculation now if we come back to the first uh, page here we can see that we have one two three four five from the first uh, page of the table and one two three in the second page so in total we need to check eight criteria to find out the capacity of this connection uh, it is better if we start in a reasonable order that we can continue with a simple flow otherwise it will be very complicated from here and there you will find a lot of uh, difficulties to to find out how to follow the procedure so here we are let's continue with the first one so first we can start with item number four that is somehow uh, familiar to what we learned from TS stuff. Column flange in bending, then we need to go to the 
6264 for design resistance. If we go to 6264, so in 6264, we can see that on a stiffened column flange bolted connections are given in class 62641. The design resistance and failure mode of an unstiffened column flange in transfer spending together with the associated bolting tension should be taken as similar to those of an equivalent T-stop flange C624. Here you can see that uh, in Eurocode usually you are referred to another clause again and again. So the first two are relevant to our case. Each individual bolt row required to resist tension. Each group of bolt rows required to resist tension. In number two, as we had this earlier in the other video, the dimensions E minimum and M for use in 624 should be determined from figure 68. And number three, the effective length of equivalent T-stop flange should be determined for the individual bolt rows and the bolt group in accordance with 6242 from the values given for each bolt row in table 64. So here you can see that it might be a little bit complicated if uh, you just read the code. If we go through 624 equivalent T-stop intention in bolted connections, an equivalent T-stop intention may be used to model the design resistance of the following basic components of which the first two are relevant to our case. Column flange in bending and plate in bending. Flange cleat, it's not our case. Base plate also is not our case. Item number two. Methods for modeling these basic components as equivalent T-stop flanges, including the values to be used for E minimum, L effective, and M are given in 626. And number four, the total effective length, sigma L effective, of an equivalent T-stop C figure 62 should be such that the design resistance of its flange is equivalent to that of the basic joint component that it represents. It is important to understand that this effective length of uh, equivalent T-stop is not necessarily the uh, length of the yielding line. Typically, it's the notional length, which means that it's uh, a kind of imaginary or fictitious length of the T-stop that should be considered. If we go to class 624, equivalent T-stop intention, uh, the design tension resistance of a T-stop flange should be determined from table 62 that we went through this uh, in T-stop uh, uh, resistance earlier in other videos. Prying effects are implicitly taken into account when determining the design tension resistance according to table 62. In cases where prying forces may develop C table 62, the design tension resistance of a T-stop flange should be taken as the smallest value of three modes. And if we have just two modes, then it, it means that if uh, prying force might not uh, develop, then we can go with two modes. We went through uh, table 62, so I do not put it again here. The only uh, important part from that table might be note number one written there in the table. From table 62, in bolted beam to column joints or beam splices, it may be assumed that prying forces will develop. So whenever we have this type of connection, we have to assume that the prying force may develop. And if we go to figure 68 we can see uh, in our case what m and e are and also e minimum other stuff so let's uh, have a look on our case coming back to page one and have the dimensions in our case the center to center of these two bolts uh, is 130 millimeter and the width of the plate is 250 millimeter. It means that the distance from the bolt to the edge of the end plate is 60 millimeter. And also this uh, column is HEB300. So let's have the information of HEB300 for HEB300. BF of column will be 300 millimeter. EF of the column is 19 millimeter. H of the column is 300 millimeter as well. 
TW, the web is 11 millimeter and also the root of radius is 27 millimeter. The other information for this example is a CV, which is the shear area of the cross section. You can find this uh, definition of shear area for uh, I beams in the Eurocode 1993 So 47, 43 a square millimeter. These are the information that we might need. So if the width of the flange is 300 millimeter, then this value will be 150 minus 65. So it will be 85 millimeter from each side. It is good to notice that in this case that we are checking the column flange, the only thing from the end plate is E minimum, which is taken. We are just talking about the uh, column flange. Now, if we look at the column flange in a 3D mode, the width is 300 millimeter and we have one, two, three rows. So here we have three rows of which the maximum tension will occur in the top level because the bending moment is negative. As a result, the upper side of the connection will be under tension. As a result, those bolts are further from the compressive flange will take more tension. So as a result, we will have the maximum tension in the first row from the top. So we call this row of the bolts as row number one. And then the next one is row number two. And if we look at the side view here, we can see that uh, the bottom bolts are quite close to bottom flange. As a result, these bolts might not be under any tension. So in Eurocode, we can just ignore the effect of these bolts in uh, compression. As a result, we have only two rows of bolts. And then we need to check these first for row one and then row two and then the combination of row one and row two, as I stated in the code. Then if we go to table 64, we can see effective lengths for an unstiffened column flange can be taken from the given table. We had this table earlier in the other example, but here we have to go through the um, bolt group as well. Circular patterns, we are familiar with that non-circular patterns for the individual bolt row. So now we have bolt row number one, bolt row number two. What we are looking for is M and E. So these are not considered as end bolt row as far as they are uh, far from the edge. If we come back to the first page, we can see that here it is far from the edge of the column in both sides. As a result, it's not close to them. And in the calculation of uh, bolt row location, it is not considered as end bolt row. Here we can see that E1 is the distance from the bolt row to the uh, edge of the column in its longitudinal direction. So we just need to have M and E. Now, if we come back to figure six, eight, we can see that M is the center of the hole of the bolt up to 80% of RC distance from the edge of the web. So now we can come back to our case and calculate M. So here, M will be from 130, half of it is 65 millimeter, then minus half of the web thickness, which is 11 millimeter divided by two, then 80% of 27 millimeter. 65 minus 5.5 minus 80% of 27, 37.9 millimeter. And E is 85 millimeter, E minimum is 60 millimeter. Now with these parameters, we can continue the calculation of L effective to understand better for each uh, individual row. I sketch these failure yield lines separately that we can see here. So if we look at the column from the side here, this is row number one, and this is considering row number one failure in circular pattern. And this is row number two. There is no difference between these two failure modes. As a result, we can assume that whatever we calculate for row, no, row number one uh, 
for L effective circular pattern will be the same as row number two. So L effective circular pattern for row number one and row number two will be two pi m of which m is 37.9 millimeter 238 and that's for the circular pattern now this is non-circular pattern if we come back to our table for the calculation here we can see that for inner bolt row it is 4m plus 1.25 times e again for both rows the value is the same row number one row number two row one and row two are the same in this example and the l effective non-circular pattern is 4m plus 1.25 e m is 37.9 millimeter and e is 85 millimeter 258 millimeter now we have l effective circular pattern and l effective non-circular pattern for both rows one and two if they are considered as individual rows so individual row row number one and row number two are the same l effective one for mode number one will be the minimum of l effective circular pattern and l effective non-circular pattern so we have l effective circular pattern to 38 millimeter i suppose yes and we have non-circular pattern which is 258 so this will be 238 millimeter and for mode number two l effective two will be l effective non-circular pattern which is 258 millimeter now you can see that not all the time the l effective one or two are the same so this is the calculation of l effective for mode number one mode number two you are familiar with the calculation of f of the bolt we had it earlier in the other example so now we have m20 that shear area is 245 square millimeter and it's m88 as a result fu of the bolt is 800 megapascal so we can calculate ftrd of the bolt which is 0 0.9 times asfu of bolt divided by gamma m2 0 0.9245 square millimeter 800 megapascal and divided by 1.25 which is 141 kilonewton then we need to calculate the uh, bending moment for each failure just to remind what we had earlier so here we can calculate the mpl1 rd which is 0 0.25 sigma l effective one as far as its uh, individual row it's the same as l effective one which is 238 millimeter in this uh, item we are checking column flange in transverse bending as a result this tf refers to the flange thickness which is 19 millimeter f by 355 megapascal and gamma m0 which is 1 so 0 0.25 238 19 355 then it's 7.63 kilonewton meter the other one uh, if the effective length was the same for both cases then we didn't need to calculate this but here we have different effective length the rest are the same 8.26 and then we can easily calculate the ft for each mode so ft mode 1 rd 4 mpl 1 rd divided by m 4 times 7.63 kilonewton meter divided by 37.6 millimeter 812 kilonewton then ft2 rd 2 mpl 2 rd plus n sigma ft rd divided by m plus 10 so here i will write the values it will be two times now it is 8.26 kilonewton meter plus n if you remember it was the minimum of e minimum and 1.25 e minimum here is 60 millimeter and 1.25 times m is 1.25 times 37.9 47.4 millimeter so it shows that the distance is 
quite long as a result the prying force if any would develop closer to the edge so it will happen in the 47.4 millimeter so n is 47.4 millimeter times uh, in each robot we have only two bolts so it will be two 141 kilonewton divided by 37.9 millimeter plus 47.4 millimeter 350 kilonewton and then FT3RD is the summation of FTRD. In each row, individual rows, we have only two, so it will be two times 141 kilonewton, 282 kilonewton. So here we can see that the um, minimum value between these three modes is 282, and it shows that the bolts are the weakest parts because we have. Uh, more capacity considering mode number one and mode number two. So 282 kilonewton is for row one and row two individually. So we don't need to calculate for row two. They are, they are completely the same for the column flange. Apart from this, we need to check also the bolt row considered as part of a group of bolt rows. Now here, if we come back to table 6.4, we can see that uh, we need to consider bolt row as part of group of bolts. So again, uh, we can have a look on the figure 6-9. So here, if we look at the inner bolt row and end bolt row in the table 6-4, we can see that inner bolt row is considered as 2P and P. And if we look at figure 6-9, P is the distance between those two uh, adjacent bolts. So in our case, I sketched also this part to understand it better. Here, if we look at the pattern, this is circular pattern and this is non-circular pattern. If we look at the way of group T-stop or group equivalent T-stop, we can see that row number one and row number two are considered as end row, not inner row. The same applies for this case. You can see that this is row one, this is row two. If I want to explain more, if we had a group of three bolts to be considered, for example, assume we had these three. Then for the group formation of yielding line, then this was the circular pattern. In this case, this middle row is considered as inner bolt row. And these two are end bolt row. Here we can see that even though we used inner bolt row for the individual circular pattern and non-circular pattern as individual row, in the formation of a group, they are end bolt row. So this is very important to consider. Here is for these two, and now we are here for this case. So the smaller of pi m plus 2e1 plus p and 2m plus 0.625e plus 0.5p. We do not have any e1 here because we are not close to the edge. So in the individual pattern also we could use pi m plus 2e1 but as far as e1 is quite long compared to the other factors so we could just ignore those two. Again it could be considered as the first row that I selected. So here we do not have E1 because we are far from the edge of the column and we can go with pi m plus p for each row. Here you can see that it's half of the T stop, half of T stop, and then again half of T stop in the other case. The same applies for the other case. So now L effective circular pattern row number one will be pi m plus p and p is the distance between these two if we come back to the first page we can see that the distance between these two is 90 millimeter 210 and l effective non-circular pattern for row number one will be 2m 0 0.625 
E plus half of P. We have M 37.9 millimeter, E is 85 millimeter, and P is 90 millimeter. So the value will be 2 times 37.9 plus 0.625 times 85, and then it will be 174 millimeter. So this is L effective for circular and non circular patterns for row number one. As far as it's completely symmetrical as shown here, we can assume that for row number two, it will be the same. So L effective circular pattern row number two, 210 millimeter. L effective non circular pattern row number two, 174 millimeter. Now we can have the summation of L effective one. So L effective one circular pattern will be 420 millimeter and sigma L effective non-circular pattern will be 348 millimeter. And for mode number one, sigma L effective one will be the minimum of these two, which is 348 millimeter. And for mode number two, it's always L, sigma L effective non-circular pattern. Now we have sigma L effective one and two. We can bring our equation for MPL one and two resistance. So these are the same because we have the same sigma L effective. So MPL1RD equals to MPL2RD and it will be 0.25, 348 millimeter times 19 millimeter square, 355 megapascal divided by one. So MPL1 and 2 RD will be 0.25348 19 square 355. So it will be 11.15 kilonewton meter. Just just to understand what it means, 348. So it means that now we have a T-stop equivalent T-stop with the length of 348 millimeter for both modes, and we have two bolts on each side. We are checking the group. Now, MPL1 and 2 RD is 11.15 kilonewton meter. FTRD is unchanged, it's 141 kilonewton. M is 37.9 millimeter. And N is the minimum of E minimum and 1.25 M, which was 47.4 millimeter. And what else nothing now we can calculate ft1 rd or mpl1 rd divided by m so here it will be 4 times 11.15 divided by 37.9 which will be 1177 ft2 rd mpl2 rd plus n sigma ft rd divided by m plus n. Please notice that now we have four bolts. So this value is going to be four times 141 kilonewton. Two times 11.15 plus 47.4 times 4141 kilonewton, 37.9. And then it is 575 kilonewton. And FT3RD, which is four times 141 kilonewton. 280 564 km. So here we can see that still the group of bolts are the weakest parts. Now to have the summary of understanding how it works, let's have a look of what we got. So if row one it starts to fail, so mode three would happen and then FT will be 282 km. If row 2 individually starts to fail, again mode 3 will happen and then FT will be 282 km. And if row 1 and row 2 together starts to fail, again mode 3 will happen and FT for total will be 564 km. Let's assume some other values just to understand this better. Assume that for row 1, if it was quite uh, close to the column edge, let's say it was FT was 200 and assume for row 2 it was 300. Now assume that for the group of bolts in this case FT it was 450 kilonewton. So now if we look at the side of this 
flange so it means that this cannot be greater than 200 this cannot be greater than 300 now we can see that the summary of 200 plus 300 is greater than 450 kilonewton as a result we have to decrease the inner bolts to balance this so we keep 200 for the first one and then we remove this one and assume that it's 250 so we can see that the summation needs to be less than the group uh, resistance capacity so it is not uh, happening at the moment this explanation is given in 6242 of uh, the code we can have a look on that so in class 6242 individual bolt rows bolt groups and bolt groups of bolt rows uh, item number three when using the t-stop approach to model a group of bolt rows the following conditions should be satisfied the force at each bolt row should not exceed the design resistance determined considering only the individual bolt row the total force on each group of bolt rows comprising two or more adjacent bolt rows within the same bolt group should not exceed the design resistance of that group of bolt rows that I explained right here when determining the design tension resistance of a basic component represented by an equivalent t-stop flange the following parameters should be calculated the design resistance of an individual bolt row determine considering only that bolt row we went through this and b the contribution of each bolt row to the design resistance of two or more adjacent bolt rows within a bolt group determined considering only those bolt rows we consider this one number five in the case of an individual bolt row sigma l effective should be taken as equal to the effective length l effective tabulated in 626 for that bolt row taken as an individual bolt row we use this as well and item number six that you can have a look on that now we have 282 282 and 564 so uh, the summation of bolt row number one and number two are not exceeding the group resistance now we can have this a sketch to show our calculation so here bolt row number one bolt row number two the bottom one is excluded as far as it is very close to the bottom flange and it will be under compression so we can just exclude that bolt in bolt row number one we have 282 kilonewton as the resistance and the same value for the second bolt row 282 kilonewton and the summation is less than or equal to 564 kilonewton that's all it's the end of this video we went through one item out of eight i guess uh, that we need to check for a connection of a beam to a column as the rigid connection we had an end plate connected uh, at the end of a beam and bolted to the column we calculated the resistance of the column flange when it's under transverse bending and this is only one item we have to check other items and then finally we can find out what the design resistance of this connection is that i will continue in the next video i will go through the columns web in transverse tension and see you there thank you for watching see you next time bye